So there's a few things to kind of address. One is when it comes to writing and um, a book and looking at examples of books that we've read. Uh, every time we read a novel or even a documentary or, you know, anything that's a memoir, when it's written really well, you create a picture. They're giving you words that allows you to create a picture in your mind. Um, and a picture is only one aspect of it. So they're describing what something looks like, but when they also add the context of what it sounds like, what it feels like, there's a lot more context around what's happening in the book. So great authors do an incredible job where they're, you're reading the words but creating a picture at the same time and it makes it very memorable. Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of the Pashim Litkas. Today we have a remarkable guest whose amazing journey spans from construction industry to corporate training, from health and wellness coaching to the world of integrative business coaching. She is a master practitioner of neuro-linguistic programming. She is a clinical hypnotherapist, but that's not all. She is also an upcoming author. She holds a bachelor's degree in architectural engineering and various certifications. So get ready for an insightful conversation as we unravel the wisdom and experiences of our guest, Stacy Rivera. Stacy, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. All right, let's start from the beginning. Uh, tell me something about, and our listeners, about your LLC, Open to Suggestions. I find that name uh, very intriguing and very unique, yeah. Open to Suggestions. Not many people are. Yeah, so it's an interesting name. Um, and at first, you know, I kind of, as we were thinking about the business, both Celso and I, my husband, um, we knew we wanted to be out there and be helping people and, you know, people who are open minded. And so we were trying to think of a company name. We came up with a lot of different versions. And then one night I laid down to go to sleep and I woke up and said, I got it. I got it. It's open to suggestion. And I have like the logo and, you know, the, what the initials meant. And so the O for open, obviously the two, the number two, instead of just saying T-O, um, was because it was he and I, right? It was going to be something we were doing together. And then the S, of course. So it was, um, it was really kind of neat that it came together. And then, you know, we started playing with it. It took like a, a little bit of time, um, but there was one person we were talking to and she said, I really love the fact that your, your company name, Open to Suggestion, isn't just about my clients, wanting my clients to be open to suggestion, but that we are also open to suggestion. So it works in both ways. And I find very often when I talk to my clients that... I'm always asking for feedback, telling them I'm open to suggestions. <laughs> and so it, it kind of makes, it comes up in conversation quite a bit. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, we, we kind of landed on that and we love the idea of it. So, yeah. This was the story behind the name, how this wonderful name come up. Can you tell our listeners and, and just enlighten me a little bit about Open to Suggestion and how you are helping the businesses and the community uh, through your LLC? Open to Suggestion has been like a work in progress. We've been, you know, spending a lot of time uh, over the course of two years refining our skill, but also in many conversations with people, getting a lot of really great feedback as to, you know, what what's needed out there. Um, I had ideas of what I thought was needed, and hearing from other professionals, I found that it was very different. Um, right now, what we're offering is five different services. We're offering business consulting, um, integrative coaching, both for career enhancement as well as personal empowerment. And then we're offering mentoring based on my experience in construction. And for Celso, he's offering it for experience as a hairstylist and an educator. Um, and then we're also providing workforce training, which is um, more generic in the field, but it's all based on interpersonal skills um, because today, you know, the 
the generation that's growing up with all this technology, those social skills are, are really need to be refined. So the workforce training is intended to help with that. Um, and it kind of gives teachings of neurolinguistics programming, but in a small doses for people to adapt, um, to embrace the different techniques so that they can use them in having more like positive experiences and how they interact with people and how they are, their perspective of situations. And then the last service is actually um, more workshops. It's facilitated workshops. So for me, I coming from the construction industry and now having all this experience with human behavior and group dynamics, I really found a lot of value into how I can help construction teams communicate better. Um, so the workshops I offer have a lot to do with like building cohesive teams or integrating an existing team, um, refining a, a team or just aligning them. So my workshops are mostly focused on how to do that through various exercises and a little bit of teachings within it as well. Um, but it's intended to kind of make a project that goes on for a very long period of time in some cases that people are actually all on the same page for the same goal. Um, and so, so I found that a lot of these strategies that through neurolinguistics help with communication, but they also help with everybody having the same picture in their mind. Um, so they've all, all these workshops have been developed in order to do that. Now the business consulting um, that I offer as well as Celso does is not the kind of business consulting that is to tell business professionals how to run a business, but it's more about going into a business and assessing the attitude and behaviors of the people in the business, whether it's in the leadership team or project team or department. Um, it's really our ability to be able to observe and identify where there may be conflicts in different people's value systems or the way that they're communicating, um, authenticity, you know, whether it's present and also if people are acting in, in that sense with, as a model of excellence. Um, so we are really assessing attitudes and behaviors, um, giving them a good audit at the end of these interviews or, you know, observations so that they can, you know, have a choice of workforce training or workshops that would benefit them. So Stacey, this was uh, very nice and um, very insightful. Um, it kind of creates more curiosity in me. Uh, if I am in your class, mm -hmm. what would I expect in your class? Well, the format of the class is a, a, a bit unique. Um, the one thing about neurolinguistics programming is we learn a lot about the subconscious mind, but also how people learn and how everybody has a different learning strength, a different way that they learn. And so our trainings are designed to kind of talk to every different type of learning. Um, we put together content so that it is it addresses everybody's internal representational systems. So we will do a lot that has a lot to do with visual, auditory, what it's not, you know, and um, as well as kinesthetic, and a little bit of what's called auditory digital, which is giving people a little bit more of a sense. Uh, what is kinesthetic? So kinesthetic is um, is is more about what you feel. Um, and so sometimes that can be a texture or it can be an emotion. So it's how a person feels about a situation. Um, so the classes are designed in order to make sure that we are constantly checking in with the audience to make sure that a, that it looks right, sounds right, and it feels right to them. Um, so we're having that dialogue as we go through the training. So our listeners and our people, people who are watching us on uh, YouTube, they'll be wondering why we are discussing it and, you know, how it is um, related to, you know, my literary podcast. But uh, see how now I think they can uh, guess a little bit 
how these things are important for a creative person. Yes. Right. Um, writing a book, uh, creating a podcast like this is a creative journey. Yes. Um, you need to be in a certain mindset uh, to be creative. Um, when that creative energy, um, you know, overflows, when you want to um, vent that out, you need that right mindset so that that energy, that creative energy is not wasted. You are actually you making a good use of it. So now I think uh, people can connect the dots that why we are talking about uh, neuro-linguistic programming, uh, NLP, which, um, so we talk about, uh, we talked about uh, what happens in the class, but I want you to a little bit uh, uh, give an impression uh, what that terminology is and, um, uh, you know, how that is important for a human behavior and their mindset. So there's a few things to kind of address. One is when it comes to writing and um, a book and looking at examples of books that we've read. Uh, every time we read a novel or even a documentary or you know anything that's a memoir, when it's written really well, you create a picture. They're giving you words that allows you to create a picture in your mind. Um, and a picture is only one aspect of it. So they're describing what something looks like, but when they also add the context of what it sounds like, what it feels like, there's a lot more context around what's happening in the book. So great authors do an incredible job where they're, you're reading the words but creating a picture at the same time, and it makes it very memorable. Um, so... You know, using words that's in a communication, for your communication in a book, and knowing these simple strategies for people to create a compelling picture so that you're telling a story that's being translated in the way that you're intending it to be translated. So that taught me a lot about how to write. And if I want to share a story, how much information I need to share as well. Um, there's also a lot about how to like create the personality of a book. And neurolinguistics programming talks a lot about how a person and a personality is created in a person. Um, there are six layers that are considered when you are talking about a person's personality. And that personality can change based on the person's environment and how they identify. So the first and the most strongest layer of our mind and our subconscious mind is identity and what our identity is at any given moment. So my, when I say identity, I'm not just saying my name is Stacey Rivera. Sometimes I'm a mom. Sometimes I'm a writer. Sometimes I'm a trainer. Sometimes I'm a consultant. Sometimes I'm a coach. Sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm a sister or a daughter. Each one of those identities has several layers to it. Um, so there's a value system that I have that associates with that identity. And every one of those values has its own belief system around it. And those belief systems inform me or inform the person with that identity what their potential is. Um, they may have a strong belief that they are able and confident to do something, and then they may have things that they lack confidence in, and that will affect their potential. And when you can understand how your identity informs your values, which informs your beliefs and informs your potential, you start to understand how that affects your behavior and then ultimately the environment or the results you have. Now, what's interesting about that type of personality is that when you were, when I was learning how to, you know, create the outline for my book, I needed to first understand that I needed to define a personality. And so given the book a name was one thing, but what were the values I wanted the book to have? What is the belief system I want to have? I want my audience to have in the book. What do I want the book's potential to be? 
and how do I want that book to behave, you know, and, and express its, you know, behavior in the community, how I'm going to express myself. Um, and ultimately, like, what's the end result, what that's going to have an impact on? And doing that first before even starting the outline, it seems easy, but it really makes you think about it. And if you can kind of capture that moment where you can make these definitions about your book, when you sit to write for two hours and then life happens and come back to your book, one thing that was very important for me was to put myself back in the same personality of my book again. I could pull that document back out, relook at it again, maybe read the last chapter so that I have this continuity in the state that I, of mind that I was in so that my writing will flow more consistently. Now, when I first started writing my book, I was just getting all my thoughts out. And then when I went back to read it, my state was changing and you could see the difference in the way I wrote. So I do believe that, you know, taking the, I now know, taking the time between each of those that each of the times that I sat down to write, I needed to put myself back in that same state of mind. So it was very interesting for me to use the neurolinguistics programming in that way. In your profile, another word which uh, struck me the most was hypnotherapist. Uh, on a lighter note, is it something to do with the hypnotism? I find that um, a lot of people are have a misunderstanding about hypnosis. I mean, there's stage shows where they bring people on stage to really, you know, do things bizarre in front of people. And it's a great show. Um, and so, I mean, hip, hypnotherapy is a little different. Um, well, let's talk about the show first, though. When it comes to going to a hypnotist as, as a stage show, you know, there are trained professionals that are up there that are doing some priming of the audience to kind of see who is, and there's phys physiological evidence that can tell them who's able to go into trance more so than others. Yeah. Um, but also so they have this ability to, you know, when they're asking people who's interested, they're volunteers. There are people that want to be on stage, that want to entertain. And so they're picking people who are volunteering to come up and entertain. And so it makes for a great show. So, so you know, taking them up on stage and then kind of deepening that, that hypnotherapy, they, you know, for the purpose of entertainment, there's a lot of willing participants. Um, but hip, being hypnotized, what's interesting about it is, is that it is a way to, for you to, to kind of lower your guard a little bit, but it doesn't relieve you or you will not ever let go of your values. Your subconscious mind is extremely protective of you and your body and your reputation and all the things that are important to you. So no matter how much you go to a show and they're asking them to do, these people are okay with going up there and entertaining that way. In a hypnotherapy session, you know, you're, what you're doing is you're like helping a person kind of overcome an obstacle, like a limiting belief and giving them more confidence by being able to work with them and their values. So a hypnotherapist isn't just like arbitrarily sitting down and like, you know, putting someone into, you know, putting them into trance and making these suggestions. Yeah, like um, they show in the movies, they, they, I mean, back in the days, they hold a pendulum and they, they concentrate on this and now you are sleeping, now you are in your past, now you are such person, now yeah. you're, it's not, it's not that. No, um, there's, the, the pendulum and the way it's used in movies is, is not really what, it's not really doing anything. Um, it's more like the words a person's using in order to help them kind of get relaxed and to be in a state where they would be open to suggestion. Um, hypnotherapy is really designed to kind of have a, a lot of time with the, um, the client to learn about what it is they're struggling with and what they really want to become. And the suggestion that is given by a hypnotherapist is a way for you to kind of help them overcome that obstacle. 
Um, it's people think that they're completely unconscious when, <laughs> when they're in hypnotherapy, but they hear every word. Um, you know, they, one of the things that they teach us when you're learning hypnotherapy is that, you know, the body does what the mind tells it to do. So, you know, during a hypnotherapy, there's ways that you can test to see if the person is in fact open to the suggestion. Um, and so, so, you know, we'll use those strategies to do that. There's some language and there's also, um, some strategies where you can help facilitate people into a trance, like a light trance. Um, but I, I think what's probably the most interesting is how much we are in trance on a day-to-day -day basis when we watch a movie and we're putting ourselves into that movie and watching what's happening. We're completely engrossed in that movie. You're in a trance. When you're reading a book and you're creating a picture, you're in a light trance. When you're driving and your mind's in another place, but you're still driving, you're in a light trance. There's, um, you know, things that we know that we have on autopilot that will chime in the second we need, it disagrees with us, right? So if you're driving and you're having a thought, somebody slams on the brakes, everything shifts, right? Because you're still conscious of what's happening, but your mind is, is kind of focused on the subconscious thought. So it gets, it's complicated to explain, um, but it is something that, you know, understanding that everybody is, their subconscious mind will always protect them. They'll always make sure it agrees with their values and agrees with their belief systems. If a suggestion is ever made during hypnotherapy that does not agree with the person's values, the person will reject it. Um, so, you know, the concern that somebody is going to make you do something that makes you look or feel bad after is unlikely. Um, it's really, you know, there's a little bit of like, yeah, you lower your guard. You don't have to worry about as much. Um, and in a world like today, isn't it nice to not have to like be so worried all the time? Um, so, you know, hypnotherapy is very powerful. It's, it really helps people kind of see the other side, see outside the box, but it's their box, you know, that they are keeping themselves in and it, the outside the box is still them. It's just a matter of guiding them to be able to go consider different opportunities and different ways that they can go about life um, and really help people who are feeling stuck. So um, you are a master practitioner of NLP, right? You talked about NLP, how it trains you to have several, uh, you know, personalities, train yourself to be something at a different, uh, uh, you know, occasion. So you are a mom, you are a business coach, you are a business owner, you are, uh, you know, you are a full-time employee or not, but at point you were... And you are also working on your book. So you are also an upcoming author. Um, so I want to talk about uh, the challenges, right? You are mom of a child who needs, who had some space, who has some special needs. Um, we talked about Nico. We talked about, you know, your, um, you know, when he came to this world, the struggles and stuff. We will not go into those details. But um, what uh, I find is astonishing, uh, you know, with moms like you who have child who needs, uh, you know, something, some, some special support. Um, there, is a, uh, there is a Desi mom group in Indian community here in Boston uh, metropolitan area. Uh, Jaya Pandey, I want to take her name. Jaya Pandey is, is uh, you know, she kind of, she has um, an autistic child mm -hmm. and she's helping a lot of people, uh, you know, in, in the community uh, through, through her initiative. So when pandemic hit, uh, moms like Jaya and moms like you, um, you know, people who, who had a very, uh, I would say, uh, you know, a, a supportive system, a family around them, um, 
they fell flat i want to see what would have happened uh, with people who needed special help uh, special support from the community from the government from you know the neighbors and from themselves and and uh, the partners as well how did you guys manage the pandemic um, with uh, with the kid that's a tough that's a loaded question <laughs> um it was tough um so our son has physical disabilities as well as some neurological disabilities um and he was in the first grade when the shutdown happened um and he had already been receiving services from the town for several years um you know when it came to like, the educational environment when the shutdown happened, um, those special ed services and so forth, everything went away. Um, and he was behind. He was struggling to learn his letters. He, it was the end of the first grade. He, he wasn't reading. Um, and, you know, when they said, okay, here's some assignments to do, I, I wasn't a teacher, you know, like, to that, you know, for first grade, second grader. Um, and it was, it was really interesting to me to see and learn how he was learning and when he was in a learning state and when he wasn't in a learning state. Um, so shortly after the shutdown happened of the schools, you know, I remember it was like the third day, the third day of trying to homeschool. And I called my boss and said, I can't do it. I just, I can't do it. I thought that, you know, I have meetings, you know, a couple meetings in the morning and a couple meetings in the afternoon. I'll do work with him in between meetings. And a child like my son, you know, he doesn't just like follow my schedule. He needs the structure of schedule. And I didn't understand that. So I'd be like, all right, we got to now. Let's go do your, you know, whatever assignment we were working on at the time. And yeah, that the time of transition and he would be like under the desk and you know, be all over the place. It was really unrealistic for me to believe that just because I had a break in my schedule that he was going to get on my schedule and that that was going to be an effective time for learning. So he, um, he's very fidgety. <laughs> You know, he, he, he definitely, um, was all over the place, but, you know, we had been through several, um, specialists by that point and learned a lot about his working memory, what recharged it and how to handle that. So I, you know, one of my, couple of my favorite stories is here he is trying to learn to read and they give us these flashcards and we're working on sight words and, I would show him a flashcard and he'd be all fidgety. And so I'd let him run around the dining room table. And then I'd show him another card and let him run. And so I just kept him moving the whole time he was learning. Um, and then eventually the summer came, we got a pool and it was like, I, I had cards with words on them and I'd throw the letters to the bottom of the pool. He'd dive down, get all the letters, bring them back up, match them with the words. But I just kept him moving. I'd show him a flashcard, he'd run through a sprinkler. If I read five cards, mom, can I run through five times? You bet, bud. You can read 10. I don't know how I did it, but he learned to read somehow with me and no help. But it took a lot of compromise. I needed to cut back on my hours at work. Um, I needed to have a dedicated, you know, time of the day to work, work with him. Um, he needed to be also be aware of what the structure was of time. And as long as I got ahead of him on him, his idea of what that day was going to be, then, then it could be effective. One thing I want to talk about before we dive into, uh, before we dive into uh, your journey as an author, um, I was reading that article about that video game uh, Nico plays um, and uh, how it changed your perspective. And when I read that article, uh, you know, it changed my perspective. And I started looking because my younger one plays a lot uh, of these games. And um, 
it changed my perspective and i i i thought it's not that bad actually you know it's, there's a learning in, in the video games as well so i want you to touch a little bit about uh, that article as well so um after studying neurolinguistics programming and you know there's a lot going on when you're learning this um skill set and it really teaches you how to listen for and identify strategies and patterns that a person uses. Um, and my son has been playing video games probably far earlier than he should have been, um, but it, it did help him with coping and so forth. And in fact, it was often used as pain management, you know, for some of the surgeries he's had. Um, and he uses that as a coping mechanism sometimes. So I sat with him one day after really kind of starting to understand that everybody has a different program they run when it comes to strategies and patterns. I just thought everybody was the same before I learned NLP. And as I was watching him play these games and listening to how he was talking about them, I realized that the games are teaching these children how to use strategies and patterns to handle situations. Um, the article I talk about is Fortnite. And, you know, I found it very interesting that as he was playing Fortnite, he was picking these characters. And, you know, it wasn't always like this big tough male that he wanted to be. Sometimes he was a woman. Sometimes he would be a fruit, like a banana. And sometimes he'd want to be a fish. And I was curious about, like, why he would pick different ones. And, you know, he would pick them because of what their capabilities were. And if he wanted a certain skill set that day to do a certain thing in the game, he would choose that character, that skin, is that they call it, or the avatar. And for me, that kind of gave me insight to the fact, like, look at he's learning that, you know, the skill set can be with anybody with any look. That inside, you know, it's what they're bringing to the table and how we can use that tool. Um, and so just kind of taking this bigger picture look at what was happening um, in the game and how he was processing the information was actually teaching him a skill set that I know is going to be really important for his future. Um, and as a construction professional, I would hear examples from him of like, hold on, I, before I take a break, I need to build walls around myself. But it wasn't just a wall. He needed to pick the wall that was going to hold up the longest because he was going to be away. And the thought of thinking about picking the right wall that was going to you know, protect him for as long as possible. The durability, the material type. And he would tell me this whole description of the specifications associated with it. I was like, okay, like he's, he's making good choices based on data. In my world in construction, that's what designers are doing, right? They're and engineers, they're picking materials and so forth that do that. So even though I knew it was taking a lot of his time, he was learning something. Um, and even during the pandemic, you know, he would be playing with other kids so they could talk to each other and they would do some, some like, you know, they get together as a team and go to a certain, you know, map and play that game. And, you know, for an only child, I thought, well, this is great. He's connecting with other kids. Would I have liked it to be in person? Absolutely. But for my son, he has some physical disabilities and the video games kind of protect that him, him from that judgment. Um, so, you know, he can't run very fast. He can't jump. He has other things that going on. And so when he's in the game, he's like every other kid. And so for him, it, it was really a sense, sense of belonging. Um, and so I, I found that really helpful for him. Wow, that's that's a totally different perspective. I mean, I I I can see that now. Uh, how a different ex experience would have been for him when he's in Fortnite. Uh, you know, when he's uh, running and 
that's 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 amazing and thank you for uh, for that article and that that perspective i think uh, when people are watching this um, they will see that uh, you know that video games are not that, uh, that you know that bad uh, so let's uh, quickly switch to uh, you know another personality of yours which is an upcoming author you have been working on a book we have talked about it so tell me about uh, your book uh, what made you to think that you should write a book i decided that the book i was going to write i wanted it to be something i could speak from the heart that i had full experience with and so it it's very much like a memoir but the lens i was trying to like share my story through was of a parent of a child with special needs um i believe a lot of parents suffer in silence um that what they're experiencing at home is that no one would understand that there's shame involved with having a child who behaves a certain way um who's processing information differently and that you know there's a lot of resources out there but finding one that's right for you know that speaks to your situation is really hard to find and so the intent of the book was to kind of using the pandemic and how much it really impacted families with children with special needs was like kind of a a good trampoline to kind of get out and give people a perspective to let them know they're not alone. Um you know there's struggles that really exist when you have a child that you're trying to understand. When you have a child who's clearly suffering and is not allowing you to comfort them. Um when you have a child who is acting out and you don't understand what's happening and you know um can come across very physical or aggressive because they don't have a way of communicating um you know that the sense of like, maybe I'm not parenting right or you know like nobody would understand and so you kind of go into this world trying to pretend like you got it all together um and you try to like hide or stay out of public situations so you're not dealing with that judgment of other people and i found that um i found myself doing that a lot um you know i wouldn't go to the grocery store cuz a couple one or two things would happen either we'd be going down the aisle and he'd be putting his hand out knocking down everything on the aisle <laughs> and i'd be like ah! you know or he'd be having like a, a temper tantrum and or you know trying to get away from me and you know it's it's very uncomfortable when that's happening in public and you know there are people out there who just be like oh, I would never let my kid do that um but there's also a lot of people in public who know exactly what you're going through and it's um i i think there's a lot more of it than people talk about i tend to be really transparent with people about my son and his challenges and the challenges for me and i find that by doing that i hear back from a lot of people me too i have a child who's doing that and you know it's one thing to hear that once or twice and then it's another thing when you're hearing it more often than not that that's a response i have a child who's dealing with anxiety i have a child who has you know autism um you know and nico who doesn't necessarily have autism but he has a lot of similar traits um and so for me i just felt like oh my gosh i would never know that there was this much out there if i wasn't transparent and allowed myself to be vulnerable and so the book really kind of talks about what it was like when all those services became unavailable and you know as a caring mom i wanted him to still excel in his education but i didn't know how um so i had to kind of get creative <laughs> so the book tells stories personal stories it talks about not just the struggles with my son but also the struggles in a marriage um you know my husband is from puerto rico and i grew up in massachusetts we have two very different you know experiences in our childhood that we bring those cultures to the table on how we're going to raise a child and when you have a child that's 
you know, acting out, you're not really sure what the right way to handle it is. Like, do you discipline them? You know, like we know that the, the way we grew up is not the same way, but what's the right way? What's going to be effective? And that can create a lot of tension in a marriage. Um, I, and I don't think it's just because culturally we're different. I think everybody has a different value system around, you know, how to raise a child, what's acceptable for discipline, what is not acceptable for discipline. Disciplining a child uh, in our childhood in India was different. In Western world, because this, this podcast is, uh, you know, we shoot here in, in, in Boston. Uh, I have audience all over the world. I have most, most of the audience, my audience is, is in India. Uh, so this disciplining a child, is it, how was it back in the 80s, like when, or 70s, uh, you know, was it same or is it, is it, is it different? Or is it, was it like this or was it different back then? Um, 70s and 80s was a whole different world than it was and than it is today. Um, in a way, I have to be careful because I don't, like these are like my opinions, is that I think that today that we have the ability to identify a child having certain anxieties, ADD, ADHD, and autism and so forth, um, or like high functioning, you know, autism and stuff um, today, but back then they didn't have those tools. And so when they were dealing with a child that was maybe handling things differently, there was a lot of discipline given to that child. And it, it you know, it, it did, and by using fear, <laughs> you know, to kind of get children to behave, um, you know, it did kind of put a lot of people and suppress people to be able to, you know, to stay within certain social norms, what's acceptable. I will say that growing up, you know, my dad was pretty strict and my mom, you know, she, the roles of, of like the mom versus the dad were different. Um, my, I found later in life that a lot, a lot of the times I thought my dad was angry at me when in fact he was really scared for me. He really wanted to protect me from all the bad things. But when he went to go tell me don't do something I was like well I want to do it you know and so I would want to defy that and learn for myself um so a couple things that I know now is that his goal was to keep me safe and sometimes when you're a child about to do something that's unsafe the way a parent gets your attention is they yell or you know they're doing something to stop you and so, you know, they're really out of love that they're like saying these things or doing these things. Um, but when you're a child, you don't, you don't register that. So that wasn't, you know, awesome by any, <laughs> by any means growing up that way. But I will tell you that as I grew up, having fear that, um, my dad would find out or that it wouldn't agree with him actually was good for me in making good choices because there were times where you go through life and there are opportunities to go the wrong way. And so in a way it was how he was able to instill in me a certain values, a certain self value of myself and how I can be confident and to, you know, take the right path because there's a lot of temptation so, you know, having the discipline of teaching them, teaching a child that was important, um, you know, it's, as a child, you, you're not really understanding the thought behind it. Um, but it is, in fact, mostly because they're afraid. A, they're, they're responsible, even as a parent today, we're responsible for this life, you know, to teach them and grow them so that they can socially be in the world without a threat. And so it's, it's uh, quite different in how people expressed it back then was how they're doing it now. And a lot of that is, I think, is a result of psychology and study of the mind and how people are behaving. So I have a different perspective today. 
Today, when my son is having a difficult time, I recognize that he is in a state of fear. He is in fight or flight mode um, that can get triggered by something small, but a lot of it is his mind is is, is kind of on this, like he's on a train that is going to worst case scenario very fast. And so to slow that down in a child who has an incredible imagination, but maybe a very negative imagination, um, you know, was challenging. It required us to really learn a lot about, okay, if he's behaving this way, something triggered that. And what was it? So the conversations changed as I was learning about my son and how he thinks through psychology, just as being a mom before the NLP. Um, you know, I learned a lot when, when he was not in an emotion and he could articulate his words that you know, there was something completely different going on in his mind than what was going on in the situation. One example, I'll tell this quick story. So there was one day, um, you know, know, he was sitting watching TV and he suddenly started just really acting out. I couldn't calm him down. He would taking all the pillows off the couch. He's pushing me, he's kicking me, he's punching me, he's doing all these things. And, you know, it wasn't until, you know, and in those situations, my goal is to keep him safe, to keep myself safe. And so just try to get it so that the temperature comes down. Um, And at that time, we were just starting to try different medications that could slow him down a little bit, which was really a challenging decision to make as a parent anyway. So, you know, he had gone through this whole experience of a meltdown and after he calmed down, he explained to me that, you know, for me, I had no idea what had caused it. He's like, well, yesterday when I was watching this certain TV show, when it ended, Papa came home from work and he and I played. Today that show ended, Papa didn't come home, so therefore he must have been in an accident. Maybe he's dead and he went like all the way down this whole path. Wow, that's that's a totally wow. Yeah. So I got a little glimpse into the mind of a child with like severe anxiety um, and fear, and that he was acting out because he was really afraid that something had happened to his father. Um, so for me, that was just like, okay, this child is processing thoughts and information, very active mind, but it was, you know, how to how to do that. And, and learning that about him helped me have good conversations with the doctor to say, this isn't about focus. It's because the focus medicine, you know, focusing on stuff was making him hyper focus on certain things. And so I said, it's more about anxiety. And so that started to shift him to be on the medication that was appropriate for him. But I needed, but I will say that even starting with the medication slowed him down enough to be able to explain it to me. And you really can't get that from a child until they're like five, six years old, right? Like they can tell you what's what they're thinking. Um, before that, it was just these meltdowns that would happen and you didn't know what was going on. How did you conceptualize your your book, which you are working on? And, and um, um, what do you think the most challenges you have faced uh, as an upcoming author. So when I was writing the book, I was writing certain circumstances around that. Um, and so, you know, I thought I'm going to share this memoir. It's, you know, pu- I want, you know, how am I going to publish it? Am I going to self publish it? Am I going to go traditional publishing? Now the classes I took on publishing a book focused mostly on self publishing. Um, but I had learned that self-publishing for me was like really depends on how good you are at marketing your book. And I didn't just want to market my book to my followers on social media. I don't have a lot. (laughs) So I was like, I'm not going to sell a lot of books and they're only going to go to my friends that know me anyway. And that's not really what my goal was. So, So I started to learn more about how to traditional, you know, publish through like a publicist and a publishing house. And, you know, that was a a journey to learn that. And so I did my research. Um, There's a publisher's marketplace, which is a great place to look for a literary agent. 
that is going to be in the field of the genre of your book. And so I did my research, picked a few, um, and then from there, I needed to learn how to do a proposal. So I did more research, found, um, I, I apologize, I don't remember her name, but she had like a booklet on an outline on how to put together a book proposal. So I'm thinking, I'm just going to email this publicist, introduce myself, give him a copy of my book, and I'm going to be on my way. Um, and then I learned what a proposal was. <laughs> and the proposal was significant. I mean, it's, it had probably like 10 different elements to it. Um, by the time it was done, it was about 50 pages because it has samplings of your writing. Um, I had put the whole thing together, picked a couple of um, literary agents to send it to. Um, and I was grateful that the first one did respond to me. It, it, and it takes time. Literary agent, you know, took about six to eight weeks to get back to me. So every day I'm checking my email thinking I'm going to like, you know, stand out. Um, but they're receiving so many proposals. Um, but this literary agent did get back to me and his, um, his feedback was, you know, memoirs are tough right now. Like anybody can write a memoir. And so I didn't know that. Um, I didn't realize that writing a memoir, you know, unless you're somebody who's significant, if you're famous or if, you know, some have a lineage in your family that is famous, you know, there's a chance you, they might be interested in your memoir. But for some mom with this, you know, special kid in a pandemic, like everybody's writing books looks about the pandemic. So I learned something and, and that was my goal. I want to put this together because but even if I were to self-publish, I want the feedback to understand, to make sure this is a really good book. When I put it out there, there's a very personal story my goal is to have an impact. And so I, um, you know, it took, I took a, I did submit it to two other agents. I heard back from one of those, um, again, saying, you know, good luck, but no, thank you. Um, not as much feedback. And, you know, I decided at that point, to relook at it, you know, should, should I keep it as a memoir or should I change it to be more of like, you know, based on true story, you know what I mean? Kind of event. Um, and so I'm still contemplating that, to be honest. I do think the story should be shared and I do want to publish it. I do want it to reach the right people. Um, and it is very much focused on the pandemic. So, you know, this morning I was looking at it again. You know, I, I put it down, I pick it back up, I put it down. Um, and I, most of the book covers like 12 months from March of 2020 to March of 2021. And how much I was already making significant changes in my life because of what the pandemic forced us to look at, right? Like really look in the mirror and realize what our surrounding is, what our family life, what our, what, how we are allocating our time and where we're giving priority. And so even though I spent most of the time writing this book from hindsight, using the NLP that I know today, applying it to what I was, you know, experiencing them and writing it in a way that I think people will really be able to you know, create that picture, I f believe strongly in, in what's been happening with society, with people, the human civilization, no matter where you are on this planet, that the effects of the pandemic are very much causing a paradigm shift in our behaviors and in our values, um, and that we're still in transition. There's a lot of pressure to go back to something which you can't really go back uh, without taking all the learnings with us. And so there's still, you know, the, the corporate world, the working world um, is still trying to figure out how to adapt 
to people whose values change from career as the most important thing to my family, my personal life, my health is the most important thing. And how do they adapt? Um, so I've decided that I'm going to, you know, continue on my book um, to really embrace the full paradigm shift of everything that's changed with me over the four years because I've continuously been evolving as a result of the pandemic. And my goal is to really elevate this, not just to moms of, of special kids, but also it's up to the business world to realize that the people that are working for you have changed just like you have changed. And that, you know, getting this concept of understanding how values have shifted has informed the way we are behaving in the workplace so that companies can start to meet people in a place where they're going to benefit from um, giving them the personal time that they need. Right now, the world we are living in, uh, especially, uh, you know, the corporate world, things have changed. People have uh, worked from home for two, three years, four years. They manage their life uh, lives differently. They managed kids the way they used to manage differently. You know, their social structure has changed. And, um, uh, you know, the pressure for handling has changed. Now they are getting back to 2019 life and be, you know before that it's it's not going to be the same because you know some things even corporates have to understand and tweak in their uh, usual life i think is 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 going to be the topic of the decade you know the way these companies are going to operate or operating because a lot of these companies are actually started uh, calling employees back, uh, you know, um, and uh, I really enjoyed this conversation, and I, I really cannot wait for your book to come uh, come out. And um, I really hope that we do another episode with you on your book. And um, I think our uh, uh, listeners they are really going to enjoy this particular episode uh, with Stacy. A lot of perspective, a lot of, uh, you know, thoughtful discussions. Uh, um, there were some soft points which we touched. There were some very deep parenting, I think, uh, we, we touched upon in this conversation. Um, so on that note, uh, Stacy, Joe, it was truly, truly an honor to have you on this show. And I wish you best of luck. Well, I appreciate you having me. This has been great, and I really do. I am grateful for having the opportunity to at least talk about it, you know, and, and hopefully um, parents, women are kind of recognizing that, you know, we're in this together, and, you know, really it's important that we show more support to each other. So, um, so I'm hopeful this is the start of a conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you.